Cape Town, one of the world's most popular tourist destinations. But it has one of the highest rates of robbery, rape and murder in the world. When the shit hits the fan, things can go pretty wrong fast. I'm on a journey to explore a city on the edge. One that is both beautiful and bloodthirsty. I'm just kind of overwhelmed. I'm going to see how crime affects everyone here. I know three people myself that have been murdered. And the extraordinary length South Africans go to protect themselves. On your knees. On your knees. It's not a matter of chance before crime gets you. It's a matter of time. I want to find out who's controlling the lucrative underworld that makes this one of the world's toughest towns. Cape Town is a magnet for 7 million tourists a year who come to enjoy the sun and surf in one of Africa's most vibrant cities. But there's a side to Cape Town that the average tourist isn't warned about. I'm here to find out how this beautiful place has become one of the most dangerous cities in the world, outside of a war zone. You can see, looking around, why Cape Town is one of the most popular tourist destinations. But this opulence gives no hint to the fact that this city has one of the highest murder rates in the world. This city is currently in the grip of a violent crime wave that claims the lives of nearly 3,000 people a year. More than triple the number in the entire UK. It's a sort of free-for-all. When a guy wants to attack a woman to rob her, He's going to rob her, but then he's also going to stand and say, you know what, I might as well kill you. Why take the chance of you actually pointing me out? To protect itself from violent crime, the city centre has been heavily fortified. One of the things you notice when you first arrive in Cape Town is how visible security is wherever you go. There's a monstrous level of security here. There's private security companies, very sophisticated, huge police presence and a huge CCTV operation. Private security guards in Cape Town are big business and outnumber the police four to one. Despite this high level of security, petty crime still remains a serious issue. Getting off a long flight walks straight to trouble, basically, because you're a sitting target. Bruce, here on holiday from the UK, had only been in Cape Town for one day when he was mugged just five minutes from his hotel. You were mugged last night, what happened? Coming out of a bar, a little bit tipsy, worse for the weather. Uh, one guy sort of spun me round. I was lucky, I mean, I wasn't stabbed or something like that. You think you're safe, don't you? You think you are, but obviously not. At two o'clock in the morning, you're asking for trouble, aren't you? In response to the fear of crime, the middle classes live in fortress homes. Some have even armed themselves. Protecting myself in my home, we've got a shotgun and I would use it. The blink of an eyelid. I carry my firearm on my leg all the time. It's easy accessible. And I also don't carry it on my, on my waist because um, criminals tend to actually see it and um, they actually tend to come for you. Cape Town's problems today can be traced back to the violence of apartheid which lasted for 46 years and claimed the lives of 21,000 people. Apartheid was a political system by the white minority government used to suppress the rights of the ethnic majority. Images like these shock the world. When apartheid ended in 1994, the city's optimism was soon replaced by a harsh reality. It now had to deal with apartheid's brutal legacy a city cut in half along racial lines with whites living in affluent urban fortresses and everyone else in ghetto slums on the outskirts of the city. Ours is a tale of two cities. You know, we have a city of incredible natural beauty and affluency and, and we also have a city faced with huge poverty and, and social issues. These slums are easy to ignore when you're surrounded by the natural beauty of the city. 
as the two halves of Cape Town do collide, and when they do, it's world news. The British government is warning its citizens to be careful on Table Mountain. Recently, Table Mountain, the city's main tourist hotspot, was blighted by attacks on hikers. And they're easy pickings for muggers who follow the trail of cell phones, cameras and fancy clothes. And I heard the sound behind me and I thought, oh, mountain runners? But before I could even turn around, I had an arm around my throat and a knife at the side of my stomach. Table Mountain is now monitored with 24-hour security. The authorities are doing everything they can to stop crime impacting on the valuable tourist economy. These are some of the better times to climb the mountain, go with a group of friends, here's some helpful numbers to punch into your mobile phone, and really just empowering people to keep themselves safe when they're exploring our beautiful environment. I couldn't believe that all this security was in place just to protect tourists from being mugged. What exactly is the threat I'm being protected from? Coming up, the shocking reality of life and death in the city. He shot himself through the mouth. That's called a protector. That's what it says in the tin. And South Africans fight back. I'm in Cape Town to find out what impact crime is having on this popular tourist destination and how the locals cope living under siege from one of the highest murder rates in the world. With the end of apartheid came freedom. We are the new people of a new South Africa. But Cape Town is still living with apartheid's brutal legacy. The police were completely unprepared for the shift from political suppression to crime fighting in the townships. And as a result, Criminals have got the upper hand. The attacks are becoming too frequent. This latest violent attack on the police has again shown just how ruthless... Here, crime syndicates hijack a car every 54 minutes. The gang opened fire on police with automatic rifles and pistols. Everybody in this country knows somebody who is being affected by crime. It's not a matter of chance before crime gets you, it's a matter of time. On the fringes of the city centre, beyond the shadow of Table Mountain, is an area known as the Cape Flats, containing an estimated three and a half million people. The Cape Flats was created when non-white residents in the city were forcibly removed from their homes and dumped here amongst the sand dunes. The area has become a breeding ground for gang activity and lawlessness, right on the edge of the city centre. If I want to find out what's really happening in the underbelly of the city, this is where I need to go. And who better to take me than the officers on the front line? The Flying Squad is an elite response unit that deals with any crime across the Cape area, from murder to hijackings. Inspector Louis Nell has been in the force for 19 years and has seen it all. This is the area we're going to be covering this evening. Uh, little red stickers uh, represent the hijackings and little orange and yellow stickers represent all the stolen and hijack recovered vehicles. Louis is taking me into the heart of the crime-ridden Cape Flats, where I've been advised to wear the police's standard issue body armour. Last year, 107 officers were murdered in South Africa, compared with just two in the UK. I'm taking no chances. The truth about any night with the flying squad here is that simply anything can happen. I come to work with the, with the idea in my head of expect the unexpected. You go around the next corner and all hell can break loose. I mean, last night was, was supposed to be a quiet night, Tuesday night. A police officer got shot again last night. And the officer survived? No, no, he's, he's, he's deceased. Deceased? Yeah, he was shot in the face. I was starting to see why policing in Cape Town is one of the most challenging yeah. anywhere in the world. Uh, Vincent, just come again. What's the problem with Things are about to get very real when the first call of the night comes in. 
driving at speed uh, to a suspected firearms incident. No idea what we're going to find. Uh, our ribs have been knocked about by the uh, speed of the car. Uh, surrounded by a rapid wire of roads and, uh, and houses and shacks, and it's just hard to believe that this whole area can be policed. Arriving at the scene, a large crowd has gathered. Uh, is it the stabbing, shooting? What happened here? They've surrounded two bodies lying dead on the ground. There was an argument between the lady and the gentleman. Uh, the, 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 he, shot, he shot the lady and then afterwards he shot himself. He, he shot himself through the mouth. I was shocked that a domestic incident on the street had escalated into murder. In the UK, it would be national news, but here they're so common the police even have a nickname for them. Lover's Quarrels. The weapon you see, the lying on the ground, is the, is the most common weapon used in the townships. It's called an Orinco, 9mm. It's the most common weapon, it's very cheap. And yeah, if you don't have a record, you can buy a weapon and have one. And it uh, doesn't take long to get a licence. The city has been flooded with cheap firearms, drugs and gang activity. It's a deadly combination that has this community living in fear. On an average night, Inspector Nell has his hands full, and the night with him has only just begun. OK, Control, where is that hijacking in progress? <laughs> this guy's beating his girlfriend. No, man, no, man, no, man, no, man. <laughs> Why you beat the woman? There's a bunch of guys that's robbing the people at the taxi rank. One of them is apparently armed. Be cautious, guys. On the vehicle, on the vehicle, on the vehicle. Unbelievable, the work that the guys do here. I'm just kind of overwhelmed, you know. Suicides, carjackings, police officer was murdered today, firearms, domestics. This is just a spit and sawdust of, uh, of police officers' work in this town. You can't even comprehend that in terms of UK policing. Simply unbelievable, unbelievable. The next morning, Cape Tonians are waking up after another night of violence in the townships. It's surreal to be back amongst the glitz and glamour of the city centre, knowing that just a few kilometres away, a lethal cocktail of guns, drugs and deprivation is tearing the community apart. In the Cape Flats and townships which surround the city, guns are cheap and life is cheaper still. Last year, nearly 3,000 people were murdered in the greater Cape Town area, compared to only 755 in the whole UK. The murder victims are all brought here to the city morgue. Chief pathologist Professor Lorna Martin and her team deal with up to 4,000 unnatural deaths a year. Most we have eight doctors here at any one time and I try to make sure that we don't do more than three autopsies each a day because you know you kind of lose the plot if you're doing more than three a day. Sure. The bodies you get here, what, what type of cases are they? This is our usual fare, I have to say. He's been stabbed multiple times. There are at least three stab wounds. The majority of our population are young adult black men. I mean, that's who are getting killed in this country. Everybody's carrying a weapon, so it escalates to killing each other. And do I have any trust in humanity? The answer is no, I don't. But uh, it's because of my job and, and what I see every day. I think there's just a complete lack of respect. The morgue itself holds many secrets from South Africa's violent past. Even in death, there was no escape from the apartheid regime. The fridges were divided. 
a fridge for the whites and a fridge for all the non-whites. Obviously all the pathologists were white in those days. If it was a white body, only white policemen could assist the pathologist with that body. It wasn't a vice versa situation. Lorna deals with the worst this city has to offer on a daily basis. And I wanted to know how she and others like her dealt with living here. You get asked, why do you stay and why, you know, why aren't you leaving? And, but then it's, it's home. And I mean, I live in Cape Town. It's the most beautiful city in the world. So, but being away, when you come back, you get the sense of you're being dropped into the boiling pot, you know, and not be slowly cooked. Oh, God, that is, that must do something to the mind. Yeah, it does. It does bother us. I mean, you know, we have to make sure that we have burglar bars, alarm systems, barbed wire if necessary. And you're always vigilant, very vigilant, getting out your car, stopping at a road. And it's the kind of uh, low-level anxiety. It's probably quite high-level anxiety that we all live with. And it's there. It's, it's, you know, it's in everybody. But not everyone is prepared to live in a state of permanent anxiety. The high murder rate has seen an exodus of South Africans emigrate to the UK. As many as half a million now live in London. For those that remain, homes are like fortresses. Some would even say prisons. I'm about to meet a group of guys who've got a very original response to the real, very real security issues facing people here in Cape Town. RentSec offers high-tech security the same as the one used by the White House and the Israeli consulates around the world. Properties can be monitored and defended from a command centre 900 miles away in Johannesburg. These burglars are breaking into a fast food restaurant protected by RentSec. But there's a surprise in store. State-of-the-art high-pressurised fog which reduces visibility to zero and has stopped 70 burglaries so far this year. I volunteered to experience this for myself. And here we go. Wow. <laughs> oh, it's a mental smell, isn't yeah. it? Correct, but we can actually add pepper gas mixed in with that. <laughs> well, that is very disorientating. Within three seconds, you simply are blind. You've no idea where you are. As a tool, very effective, amazing. I can empathise with the South African fortress mentality. If it was my family, there would be no limit to how much I would spend to protect them. I, I know three people myself that have been murdered in South Africa, so um, it is something that over the last 15 years or so we've had to deal with and, uh, you know, potentially crime is changing, it evolves all the time. So when you, when you fill a gap in one particular area, they move on to different areas. Personal safety is such a big concern in Cape Town that I went to find out how people protect themselves from danger. In the southern suburbs, Charles Montgomery runs Suburban Guns, one of the largest exporters of firearms from South Africa to the auction houses of the UK. Come on around. Inside here, we've got uh, in the region of 3,500 guns in here. It's a 12 gauge shotgun called a protector. That's what it says in the tin what we call a little bling gun. If anyone's going to buy a gun for self-defence, uh, we would encourage a woman to buy something like a 38 Special. Previously, it was possible to buy a gun even with a criminal record because enforcing checks was difficult. As a result, many unsuitable applicants slipped through the net. Now that legislation is more stringent, there's been a spike in the sales of non-lethal devices like the American-made Pepperball. It doesn't need a license and can be bought over the counter. All right, so you aim for the chest or the stomach. Yeah. Ready to go. Mm. And does that hurt when you... Oh, that that's that? terrible. The guy's wearing a T-shirt and you're shooting. It's going to push the T-shirt into his skin. And it's incredibly painful. But the real thing is the dust itself. I don't think he has much time to feel pain because by the time he starts vomiting and he... Eyes are burning like hell, you can't see. So who would mostly buy this? Who would you recommend? Well, general public, um, especially those people that have had the nasty experience of being robbed, attacked, hijacked, which happens fairly often. Whilst I was here, I wanted to find out more about the proliferation of illegal firearms on the street. The gun that most interests me is the Norinco 9mm, 
which we saw being used last night to such devastating effect. Made in China, it's the most commonly used gun in the townships. Cheapest chips. How, uh, so how much is it? 80 pounds, 80 English pounds. That's extraordinary, isn't yeah. it? Absolutely extraordinary. A new gun for a pistol. And yeah. of course, it's as well, cheap as it is, it's as lethal as any other pistol. Yeah. They were imported in, in uh, container loads. These guns, um, you know, are have found themselves heavily involved in crime in the wrong hands. They do end up on the street. According to Amnesty International, the Norinco has a high currency on the black market. They're smuggled into Cape Town by Chinese triads and bartered with street gangs for drugs. I've never shot a gun before, so I was curious to feel firsthand what the Norinco was capable of. OK. Oh, yeah, you got it. There we go. Well done, sir. That's pretty good shooting. <laughs> How did I do? I have no idea if I hit well, anything. If you have a look, you've, you've, you've got every single one in the target. That is an absolute <laughs> miracle. I was just scared holding it. I think for me it was really kind of nervous knowing that I had a kind of uh, a machine in my hands that could kill, but to have it in your hand and to feel the power behind the first time I've ever pulled the pistol, it's like, ooh. If I can hit the target with no training, then imagine how dangerous this gun could be in the wrong hands. Coming up, the devastating drug fueling the crime rate in Cape Town. What a terrible, terrible story. And the mom pushed to breaking point. I put the rope around his neck when I pulled tight and tighter. I'm exploring the violent underbelly of Cape Town, where the police are fighting an uphill battle against crime. I mean, this is a tough, tough place, and it just seems impossible to police. A lethal cocktail of firearms and drug abuse in the townships is threatening to overspill and engulf the city centre. When democracy arrived for South Africa in 1994, Cape Town was turned into a fashionable tourist destination overnight. But alongside the influx of visitors, the city has had to deal with the arrival of more sinister elements. International drug cartels. Organised crime saw the gap far smarter than the police chiefs and started moving in to a South Africa where there was very little capacity to deal with crime because the capacity had been diverted to deal with political opposition. Cape Town has become a crucial transshipment point for the narcotics trade because of its ideal position between East and West. The city has been flooded with a drug called Tick, a crude form of crystal meth or speed. Since exploding in 2002, Tick has now become the primary drug of choice in the Cape Flats area and is directly fueling the crime wave in Cape Town. I'm on my way to meet a group of guys who have agreed to talk about their addiction to Tick. I'm curious to find out why this drug has got the city in its vice-like grip. This is their equivalent to our equivalent of a crack den. And it's just a rundown place where they can keep an eye out, see who's around, and they can get a privacy and, and do their shit. The drug causes paranoid delusions and violent behavior. And I don't know what mood the addicts are going to be in when they arrive. Where do you want to sit, guys? We can have a chat. We can't, we can't do it just in the wind. No problem, just do whatever you want. Before speaking to me, they need a hit. It costs 50 rand, the equivalent of only three pounds. A lot of money in a city with almost 50% unemployment. Now the evenings are open. <laughs> and how long would that last? How long? <laughs> this. No, weekend. Three rounds. Three rounds. And uh, then we like need more, you see, just to calm us. Otherwise, we're gonna 
run around like mad around. people. It and really it makes your, your head and your neck stand up. And what does it make you feel? How do you feel? I feel lighter. I feel more energetic. Can you explain to me what the ingredients uh, uh, are in, uh, in Turk? You, you don't want to know. <laughs> like kitchen material, like... Uh, so this is, this is part of it. stuff. So this, is, this is part of it. What's that? This is cheek bleach. 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 Yeah. So bleach. Toilet cleaners and such stuff. stuff. Yeah. All that shit they throw in there. Red tax. Poison for the, for the rats, my bro. But inside of our bodies, it's a raw. Police say it's a very aggressive drug. Yeah, to some, yeah. You do it every day? Well, if I have the money, I'll do it every day. And do you have a job at the moment? No, I don't have it. It's not everyone that knows I'm doing this, you see. I'm just keeping it on a low profile. The mood has improved very suddenly, I have to say, in the, mood, in the room. It's an escape from the pain and lack of opportunities, lack of jobs, but also it, it is a, um, a trigger for violence, um, for crime, and uh, a, lot of, a lot of misery. In Mannenberg, a township in the Cape Flats, I've been invited to Sunday lunch with a difference. Every weekend, this group of ex-gangsters meet up to relax and smoke marijuana grown in their own backyard. So this is Between them, these guys have spent more than 40 years in prison as members of the 28s, one of the most powerful prison gangs in Cape Town. Don't remember me. Remember the day when I was born in an evil place. We are the gangsters. Even in prison, if you go into prison, we are the rulers in prison. To survive, we must just stick together. Even this group of hardened ex-cons have to watch their own backs. You are surrounded with people that carry guns, people that are high on drugs. I mean, a guy with a gun and that is intoxicated with drugs is a very dangerous combination. So if you walk on the wrong place at the wrong time, you fuck. This is Macadine, a former boss responsible for punishing other gang members. I've been told he once cut out someone's heart while still alive. No, I was quite naughty. Did terrible things, but okay. I was forgiven along the way. Since his release from prison, Macadine says he has turned his back on crime because he's seen how street gangs are now exploiting the youngest generation. The fashion now is that um, we use school children. School children is not suspected. You won't know when a school child comes up to you that he's coming to kill you. And that's not the only way how they use the kids. They would uh, put children on the stuck or unga and then they would send them to, street, to the streets and pump on them. This generation, um, among us, we call them the most stupid generation. I was shocked that gangs have started using young kids to do their dirty work and paying them in tick. A new generation of young Cape Tonians are being robbed of their future by a mixture of bleach and rat poison. It isn't just the Cape Flats community under siege from the tick epidemic. Its effects have reached one of the city's most affluent areas. In Hout Bay, a seaside town popular with tourists, the locals live side by side with one of the newest townships in the city. In the space of just a few years, it has grown from 400 families to an estimated 40,000 people. And crime has soared. The main problem we have is stealing for drug money, tick. I'm not trying to paint a bleak picture, but we've seen definitely prostitution 10, 12 years old. The local expats decided enough was enough and took matters into their own hands. 
A sophisticated neighborhood watch scheme was set up using two-way radios, lookout points and residents on patrol. Crime has been reduced by 40%. The police cannot do it, not because they don't want to. They're overworked, undermanned, underpaid and outgunned. When the shit hits the fan, pardon my French, everybody has to be aware that things can go pretty wrong fast. 61-year-old Rob Patterson is originally from Scotland and has lived in Africa for the past 18 years. He served in the SAS and was a communications officer during the Falklands. Now retired, his training has unexpectedly come into good use. This is, can also be a kind of watchtower for you, is that right? If there are any muggers on the beach, they generally come up over the top and disappear in there. But we then have people, watchers up in the high hills here, above me up in the mountains, on the hillside there, they can see those people. This is ironic that it took a kind of crime wave to actually bring a lot of strangers in the community and expats together. The people you think are your friends will never come. It's the, the people you would never consider bond, group together, and the secret was trying to encourage the older ones to come in to the group. Just because they weren't fit enough to run up a hill had nothing to do with fitness, but we need your eyes and your ears. WatchCon's star recruits are the two ladies in the self-styled A-team. Expats Val from Wales and Anne-Marie from Austria go on daily patrol, on the lookout for anything suspicious. So you see them just hanging around here. Normally, you could say there's about a hundred or more just sitting around by the traffic lights. People have been encouraged not to um, open it, wind down their windows, and sometimes they actually snatch things like jewellery from your neck and that sort of thing. Pause a little bit, but he should be there. So, what's he doing? It's mainly their pace and the way they look. He's walking fast for an African. Which is not being derogatory. It's just the whole body language. There's something about them they think, oh, that doesn't look right. You get a sixth sense about it. Val should be a police detective. She's very good. <laughs> just then, a call comes through from Dario's the local cafe on the seafront. About 25 minutes ago, a cell phone was taken from my dad's garage. Um, the guy, got scores all over his face. They took praise in here. That's the, that's the shop. Mm. God. When the ladies arrive, the thief is nowhere to be seen. For owner Dario and his staff, this is not their first encounter with petty crime. One of my other girls got mugged on the beach, but she beat them both up, two young little boys. She's quite big and she knocked the, the day's lights out of them. But it happens very often, very frequent, and it's sad because it's a beautiful place. Whilst the fear of crime has mobilised the white community to protect itself, many in the black community aren't as fortunate. I've heard about one story more than any other which epitomises the devastating effect drugs are having on entire families. 47-year-old Ellen Packey's son started smoking tick at the age of 14. He turned from a happy-go-lucky teenager into a drug addict who physically and mentally tormented her for six years. Until she could take it no longer and was driven to do the unthinkable. She killed her own son. We had to do the interview, obviously, in a safe house because this community remains divided. Those who say that she was an abused uh, mother pushed to the brink and those who say she was a cold, calculating murderer. Ellen is out on bail awaiting trial. She's agreed to tell her story for the first time about what happened. I'm going to find out for myself what turned this mom into a murderer. Ellen, just tell me what kind of uh, boy Adam was. You know, he was always a person who sings, make his own music, wanted to dance, and he will make you laugh, you know. And um, um, 
And as you look back, yes. he was beginning to get addicted to tick at that stage. Yes. If I look back, it was becoming so terrible. Where Abby used to just smash my all my windows at the back, you know. I had to put burglars up there in my house. You put kind of burglar prevention against your own son. He made me a prisoner in my own house, you know. I called the police lots of times. They used to tell me, well, they can't do anything about this. He would throw me with water in my face while I'm sleeping to get up to go to work. He would steal my things and then I have to pay him to go get the things back. And um, when the end of the month come, when I get my wages, I have to give it actually all to him, you know, to go and just smoke it out or do whatever he needed to do, you know. And on the, that um, day you snapped, what, can you remember much of what was going through your head? I went inside and uh, that's when I went to go get the rope, you know, and um, I then um, stand there with the rope in my hand. I, I, I don't know, I was hesitating and hesitating and then I think, well, I'm going to just now do it, you know. I put the rope around his neck and I thought to myself, but this is not right, it doesn't feel right to me. But what he doing isn't also right, why is he doing this to me? I just want him to stop with whatever he's doing. And that's when I pulled tight and tighter and then I, my hands was cutting. So I took his top and I'd wrap it around my arm and I just pull it tighter and then put it, the rope around the end of the bed. And I was standing there and I said, you know, while I was standing there, I just said, Lord God, forgive me for what I did. sends chills down my back just thinking of oh, here is a mother driven to such a terrible crime. I don't think she thought she had any other option. I don't think she th that she thought that there was another way. She knows she snapped and there's a terrible pain at having killed her son. She sought help from everyone and no one was there to uh, give her a helping hand and not the police, not even the church, not her family, not her community. Uh, she was living in a prison created by her son, created by this terrible uh, drug tick. What a terrible, terrible story. But it's a small little window into the ravages that that drug tick has on this entire community. Since filming, Ellen has been found guilty of murder and is awaiting sentencing. In a city with murderers and drug dealers allowed to roam free, this mother was facing life in prison because she had been abandoned by the system. Both sides of the city are being forced to protect themselves against the drug epidemic sweeping their communities. But the biggest threat facing the whole of Cape Town is more hidden and far more sinister. Coming up... I've had two hits put out on me. The influence of organised crime. Crime is too big an issue, yeah. My journey into Cape Town's underbelly has been a shocking eye-opener. When I first spent some time here in Cape Town, I was genuinely scared. I was anxious. There's a feeling of constant anxiety here that people are not safe. And the police are overwhelmed by the scale of the problem. Stepping in to fill this vacuum are powerful foreign crime syndicates who've started to control large parts of the city. We have a colourful bunch. Uh, and Cape Town is very popular. This is where the successful bosses tend to hang out. Uh, the beautiful beaches, the wine farms, the law enforcement agencies threw up their hands and said, we don't know how to cope with this. Once the police realize groups like the Chinese triads and Russian mafia 
had already established themselves, it was too late. One businessman in Cape Town who knows what it feels like to be at the wrong end of organised crime is Shane Harrison. He runs Mavericks, the largest upmarket strip club in the city. You can't do decadence cheaply and nastily. You've got to do it stylishly. Then, then it becomes actually quite cool and funky. Things started to go wrong when the Russian mafia tried to muscle in on his business and steal his girls. Once Mavericks started doing well, they decided they wanted a piece of the action. So they tried to uh, muscle in, you know, old, old, old school, school tactics. Yeah, yeah. I've had two hits put out on me. Uh, the first one, they blew up my car. They came looking for me in the club. My general manager got pistol whipped by three thugs with, with, with pistols. The man responsible was Yuri, the Russian, Yulinitsky, the most feared criminal boss in Cape Town. Yuri, the Russian, was thought to be the boss of the Russian mafia in South Africa. That particular individual is no longer around. He was killed in a very bad, uh, you know, incident. But I mean, he was a he was an underworld figure that lived Reek. by the sword. Reek, but yourself. Yuri the Russian was gunned down on the streets of the city in a brutal attack that also claimed the life of his four-year-old daughter. Yuri Zelenitsky's wife is the only survivor of this apparent contract killing. The murder remains unsolved. The Russians and other syndicates have moved into Cape Town to capitalize on the lawlessness here. Can the city stem the rising tide from these dangerous criminals? That night, I met back up with Inspector Louis Nell from Cape Town's Flying Squad. He's on the front line working in difficult circumstances, and I want to know if the criminals can be beaten. Do you think it's, it's possible to get a, a grip on the crime without kind of ghettoizing the city? I don't think it's possible to police our crime in this country. Crime is too big an issue here. It's, it's too big a thing. Too many people live off crime. And is that disheartening for you, um, knowing that you can just keep the lid on it? Whether he's going to be on the street tomorrow again, I'll lock him up again. He'll do something wrong again, and I will lock him up again. And I will keep on locking him up until he gets fed up with me. And it does happen, and he will come for me eventually. You have to have, be a certain personality to be able to handle that, I suspect. Yes. Um, I, don't know, I suppose you have to have a split personality for that matter. I've seen the worst this city has to offer. But despite this, I fundamentally believe in the ability of people here from all across the racial divide to make this town a better place to live. I'm very positive and uh, I do believe that South Africa will sort itself out. Um, we're never going to be a city with no crime. I don't think any big city is going to be a city with no crime. Cape Town's got enormous prospects. I mean, otherwise I wouldn't have invested. I could have lived anywhere. People say, why do you want to stay here? Well, the answer is there. The sun goes down there at night, sat up here with a cup of tea, g &T, game on. I really hope the future for Cape Town is more Cape Hope than Cape Fear. Battle lines being drawn. Nobody's right if everybody's wrong. And after the break, the continental feel continues as we travel to Estonia to witness people embarrassing themselves and us. Boozed up Brits abroad next.